Hey, Sonny Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. You knew this story was coming, so you better not be shocked by it. Loudoun County, Virginia. I went my whole life without ever hearing about Loudoun County, Virginia, but we're hearing about them now because this is home to one, maybe one of, if not the most woke school districts in the entire country. And this is the story of dad, Scott Smith. Now, just a couple days ago, I think on Monday's show, we talked about Scott Smith but I didn't know his name and we didn't know his story. He was just a guy who got arrested at a school board meeting. And the reason we talked about him is because this was the proof that the National Association of School Boards used that there's been a, a shocking rise in violence at school board meetings, right? The, NS, the National Association of School Boards, they wrote a letter to Biden and, and in it, it said, in Virginia, an individual was arrested Scott, another man was ticketed for trespassing and a third person was hurt during a school board meeting, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at footnote 13, they link to this story in Washington, D.C. That footnote, and we got the headline right here from the local NBC affiliate. That footnote is about Scott Smith. Now, he wasn't violent. Well, here's the arrest. We have the video of the arrest. This was this moment was the best. Watch it. This video was the best example that the National School Association of School Boards could use for the violent increase, or the increase in violence at school board meetings. And Scott and you are domestic terrorists because of this moment right here. Now, you can look at that moment right here and say, oh, this man's out of control. Can you believe it? Can you believe he would do such a thing, fighting against police officers? Blah, blah, blah. Are you curious the backstory? What would cause him or anybody or potentially you to act like that? The National Association of School Boards, the Department of Justice, the FBI, FBI, they call that dad a domestic terrorist. But do you know why Scott Smith was so upset? Just pause for a second here. Let's think, let's consider what possibly could have made Scott Smith that upset. It was it critical race theory? Masks, a mask mandate in the school? What could it be? I mean, he's a domestic terrorist, so it better be something. What we didn't, what we, I, the people, American people did not know, the media knew, they didn't report it though, but it was known, but now we all know. A few weeks before that meeting, a few weeks before that moment, a boy wearing a skirt went into the girl's bathroom at the school and raped Scott Smith's ninth grade daughter. Now, when the National Association of School Boards wrote their letter to Joe Biden calling this man a domestic terrorist, they did not include that little nugget of information. They left that part out. They made him out to be some crazy loon threatening the school board. But put yourself in Scott's shoes for a second here. Your daughter is in school, ninth grade, so she's 14 years old, goes to the bathroom. There's a boy there, transgender. Right. He's a boy, but he's wearing a skirt. So he's a girl now, because he says he is. And your daughter's raped in school. The boy got arrested. He's a minor, right? Charged with, and I'm sorry to be graphic here, but like this, graphic but accurate. Two counts of forcible sodomy, one count of anal sodomy, and one count of forcible fellatio. Those were the charges against the 15-year-old boy in the girl bathroom against Scott's daughter. So. Matt, as I'm telling this story, imagine you're Scott. This is your daughter, all right? School calls him up and says, hey, Dad, you got to come to school. Uh, your daughter was physically assaulted. Okay. I'm not sure what I would think that was. Uh, it could be anything. I'm going to assume the best, some sort of scuffle in the hallways. No big deal. He gets to school, and he learns from his daughter, who's obviously distraught, that it's much, much worse. He talks to the school board, or the school the principal, or whoever. And they said... 
we are going to handle this in-house. <laughs> in-house? What, what, what do you mean you're going to handle this in-house? Do you have your own electric chair for rapists in the basement of the school or something? What are you talking about? You got your own jail? You got your own prison in the school? In-house? Now, why did the school want to handle this in-house? Because the administrators are a bunch of super woke progressives who know that parents have been concerned about this very thing happening with a transgender boy or whatever, a boy in a girl's locker room or bathroom. And they knew that if news got out that this is what happened, then this would be a giant step backwards for trans girls' rights. Forget about girls' rights. That doesn't matter. Like the girl raped. We're talking about trans girls' rights. Quick sidebar on this. This is important. It's been a while since we've talked about the oppression Olympics. I just want to make sure we're all up on this. So there is a, uh, there's different visuals you can use, but I like this totem pole of oppression. Okay. At the bottom of the totem pole, uh, so really the oppressors are white, straight white men, straight white Christian men. In this case, a white boy would be the, the main oppressor of everyone. Right? And then you, you keep going up the totem pole, up, keep going up the rings of the ladder, right? The first rung of, of oppressed people is woman, right? If you're a woman. But then you keep going up, right? And you add to that. So now you're like Hispanic, and then black, gay, fat, right? You just keep going up. You keep climbing the totem pole, and you add up all these different oppressions together so that you're uniquely super oppressed. Not super. Way up at the top, the top of the oppression totem pole, the gold medalist of the oppression Olympics, at the very top, untouched, like reigning champions, undefeated, are the train. Trans rights trump all other rights. So you're asking, why would the school and the school board and the administrators support the boy, rapist, like ultimate oppressor, raping, rapist boy? Why would they support the boy over the girl? That, that, what, I, thought, well, I thought we were like, believe all women or what, like, what are we? Nah, not all women, especially not white women, but certainly no one else over the trans person. The trans person is the most oppressed and can do no wrong, can never be the oppressor. They're the most oppressed. And it's extra weird because this trans person is a boy. So he's really the ultimate oppressor because he's a boy, but magically because he's in a skirt, now he's the most oppressed and even when oppressing can do no wrong. And if we bring attention to this, then it will just victimize other trans kids. So, Dad, we're going to go ahead and handle this one in-house. He did what every other dad would do and flipped out. And he demanded that the police get involved. So eventually, he's in the school still, right? And eventually, the police show up. He's like, oh, thank goodness. Thank you. Police walk, and he's like, hey, cops, you're not going to believe what just happened here. And it took him a couple seconds before he realized that those cops were there to arrest him. Imagine that moment. You thought the police were on your side. Well, actually, first you thought the school, the school would be on your side. Your daughter just got raped. But then you quickly find out that they're against you because she got raped by a trans person, so it's okay. And then you think the police are on your side, and then you find out that they're there to arrest you. What the heck is going on? Imagine that feeling of powerlessness. So he said, thank God that he, I did draw enough attention to it. He did not get arrested, but he did get an escort by the police to the hospital and they administered a rape kit to his daughter. Right. Now, dad was uh, advised by his lawyers to, uh, be, to remain silent about this. If you want to get justice for your daughter, remain silent. Don't talk about it. Don't make a big thing about it. Right? He's like, okay, fine. I'll do, what, I'll do what you think is best for my daughter. And I can focus on my daughter and helping her heal and all that. Right? The kid who did this, 15 years old, was put on house arrest. So the dad's like, okay, fine, good enough for now. Uh, the trial or the court date was supposed to be October 14th. And it was going to be a plea deal, and they were going to lower it to a lesser sexual assault charge, but whatever. At least it's something. That never happened. Why did that never happen? Because on October 6th, the trial was on 14th. On October 6th, that boy was charged with sexual battery and abduction after he forced a girl into an empty classroom held her against her will, and sexually assaulted her. And you think, well, hold on, sir. I thought he was on house arrest. Yeah, yeah, house arrest, except you can leave to go to school. 
the same school that he raped the girl in a couple weeks prior. So that trans kid did it again. So now you've got to imagine you're that girl's father. And you find out that the school knew this kid was a rapist and still didn't protect your daughter because trans rights. You with me? So that's the background of this school board meeting. Okay? Now, sorry, I shouldn't say that. That's the background of the moment. You know what the school board meeting was about? Protecting transgender students. <laughs> the that meeting was specifically about protecting transgender students. Huh? So people started to voice their concerns, generally, because no one knew the specifics of this story yet, right? It wasn't, it wasn't public yet. So people are generally concerned about this like, boys and girls locker rooms, right? And the dad was told, again, to keep everything under wraps. He didn't speak. He was just there watching the whole thing. And people are speaking of this hypothetical danger that could exist, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the superintendent. You ready for this? The superintendent said this at the board meeting. I think it's important to keep our perspective on this. We've heard it several times tonight from our public speakers, but the predator transgender student or person simply does not exist. Now imagine you're in the audience. You hear the superintendent say that. Your daughter just a few weeks ago was raped by a predator transgender student in the school. The superintendent knew this happened because it's already happened twice. And you know that that superintendent's lying. And then, as you can see in the video, he's actually facing uh, behind him. This is a little later in the meeting. Actually, they canceled the meeting. Uh, they called it off at this point. That's why there's almost no one in the room anymore and the dad's stuck behind, right? But you can see he's talking to someone behind him. Some activist woman is sitting behind him. And the activist woman, wearing like a gay pride shirt or whatever, told dad, I don't believe your daughter. Then he called her a B, and an officer grabbed his arm, he pulled it away, boom, there you have it, he's on the ground. Handcuffed, being dragged away. Now there's also a video of him being pulled away and his pants pulled down as he's being dragged across the floor. And that's the image that's been thrown all over the TV and newspapers all around the world. And the headline, violent protesters at school board meetings. Major uptick in violence. Sick the Patriot Act against these domestic terrorists. So that's the background. That's what happened. Now you know the rest of the story. Now, this absolutely should be the biggest story in the country right now. But of course it won't. <laughs> right? Of course it won't be. Because it's mean. Now, if it ever does leak out and get some traction, then it will be dismissed as a conspiracy or it'll be, uh, they'll be flipped around and you'll, it'll be used to attack you. How dare you smear all transgender people? It's actually transgender people who are the victims of such heinous violent acts every day and they're not safe and they're murdered all the time. And that's how that will be spun. You know their tricks. But just know this, a 15 year old boy dressed as a girl raped two girls four months apart and the only person arrested is the girl's dad. Worth noting as well that Loudoun County, Virginia, it's a normal place. In 2015, as recent as 2015, every member of the Board of Supervisors, the County Board of Supervisors was a Republican. The Congressperson was a Republican up until 2018. It's just a suburban, it's 112,000 medium income, so it's like upper, upper middle class, like nice place to be. And just last few years has been completely run over by progressives. School board, county, everything. The uh, City attorney, I don't know her official title, it's something like city attorney. Her name's Buta Beberaj. Like psycho far left George Soros activist. Like defund the police, criminal justice reform, like, like get rid of prisons, like the whole thing, right? So this dad, Scott Smith, gets arrested. Misdemeanor charge, okay? Now, she's the city attorney. Her main guiding principle is just like all the progressives city attorneys all across the country, right? It's like, we don't want to send people to prison. Prison's mean. It hurts them. These criminals are victims and blah, 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 thing, right? July 30th, there's this guy, well, it doesn't matter his name. He, like Peter or something, he was released from jail on a $5,000 unsecured bond 
while facing charges of strangulation, abduction, and assault. Okay? A few months later, he was released. Right? We don't want to we don't want to put him in prison because prison's a bad it's prison's bad. Okay? Prisons are very mean. And he's the real victim. So he was released. Just a few months later, he finished the job. Killed his wife with a hammer. Okay? I bring him up just to show you the, the, the philosophy of the city attorney. And just a couple days after that guy was released from jail, Scott Smith was in court for two misdemeanors, disorderly conduct, obstruction of justice, two misdemeanors. Now, of course, a misdemeanor charge, right? Like, whatever. But the city attorney herself showed up to try to put him in jail. Jail. Like, a misdemeanor, you get like a $100 ticket. <laughs> like, maybe a $1,000 ticket. Maybe. It, usually the whole thing's just dismissed, especially if the, uh, the, his lawyer could be like, judge, hey, here's the background, what happened? Like, okay, don't do it again. Community service, boom, that's how that goes. The city attorney showed up to the courtroom and fought it herself, wanted, wanted this guy, the dad, you, to go to jail. The guy, the Scott's lawyer is like, what are you, t 15 years I've been doing this. I've never seen anyone ever attempt jail time for a misdemeanor charge, and I've never seen a case argued by the city attorney herself. And coming from a progressive who prides herself on trying to, to get people out of jail or prevent people from ever going into jail. We're gonna, we're gonna actively let violent criminals out of jail, yet she wants this dad to be thrown in jail? Amazing. All right, we gotta go. We got Dan Crenshaw coming up in a little bit. Actually, I wanna ask him about this story as well because he's been talking about it. But just in conclusion, know that this is how crazy it is and could be for you. It's not, it, it happened in Loudoun County. It happened to Scott Smith. And I guarantee you, plumber Scott Smith never thought it would. And maybe you don't think it would either. And if it does, or something like this happens, you will be dismissed. You will be ridiculed. You'll be attacked as a domestic terrorist. And they'll try to throw you in jail. For a misdemeanor. We're so far out in left field right now. We're like still debating, should we let boys into girls' locker rooms and bathrooms? And then when the worst happens, you'll be treated like the enemy. True story. Mike Slater. I want to talk about a pattern that the media has shown whenever they are presented with a story that cannot be denied. This is what they do. They have three steps to it. First step, say it's not happening. It's a conspiracy theory pushed by crazy conspiracy theorists. First step, it's not happening. Second step, okay, fine, it's happening, but it's just a temporary thing. Third step, it's happening, but it's a good thing that it's happening. That's the timeline, right? Inflation is the most obvious example. Very first uh, beginning of it was, there's no inflation. You're crazy. There's no inflation. This won't cause inflation. No way will this cause inflation in any way whatsoever. That's the first step. Second step, fine. There's inflation, but it's transitory. That's what the Fed told us. The Fed told us a couple weeks ago. It's transitory. It's temporary. No big deal. Don't worry about it. Everything will go back to normal. And now we have this article from the Washington Post. Uh, yeah, it's inflation. And you know what? Inflation's great. We need more of it. Longer, harder. <laughs> the Atlanta, I'll give you more examples. That happens all the time. Uh, the Atlantic had an article the other day about masking kids. And the woman who wrote this, she's pro-masking kids. But she started to talk about some of the, the negative side effects of masking kids socially for their development, stuff like that. But her conclusion was that it's, in the end, it's a good thing to mask kids even if it hinders their emotional development because it helps them with other aspects of their development. Like uh, they can't see faces, but they, they're, they're better at body language awareness and stuff like that. 
So, masking kids. Started off with, we're not masking kids. We would never mask kids. That's ridiculous. Second thing, well, we need to mask kids. But it's only temporary. Don't worry. And it doesn't cause any of those hard, harmful side effects that you're talking about. And now it's, we definitely need to mask kids. Probably forever. And it's a good thing to do. Tomorrow's special. We got some amazing guests. One of them is about, uh, one of them is a, someone, a member of the LA Fire Department. This is, talk about a story no one's talking about. You ready for this one? Half of the LA Fire Department is going to be fired next Friday. Half of the Los Angeles Fire Department for not receiving the vaccine. More than half, actually. Pretty amazing, right? So here's how the media is handling this. First, they're saying it's not happening, even though it will, because they're already past the date when they need to get their first vaccine in order to be fully vaccinated by next Friday. So it's happening. But right now, they're in that stage. It's not happening. Once it's undeniable, next Friday, the media is going to say, oh, okay, sure, fine. Um, we have staffing issues. Sure, there's some staffing issues at the fire department, but don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's temporary. Everything's under control. No problem. Then it will be turned into a good thing. You know what? We lost half the fire department. But there were too many white males in the fire department anyway. Right? It wasn't, the fire department in Los Angeles wasn't representative of the, the people they serve. So now that we fired them, and they're, they wouldn't say fire, now that they're, they're gone, we can now hire more women of color to be firefighters. This is what our city needs anyway. This was a purge, not just of the unvaccinated, but of white supremacists. So now we can have a more equitable fire department. So it's good that they were fired. Wait for it. On the uh, vaccine and masks and mandates and all that stuff, how about this absolute gem? Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, right? His 12-year-old daughter is not vaccinated. <laughs> she doesn't have it. She doesn't have the shot. It's tucked way into the end of an LA Times article. The LA Times article is about schools and who can opt out and not opt out. And just so you know, in California, probably in January, they're going to pass a law that says no exemptions, medical, religious, nothing for anyone five and up. I guarantee you that's coming probably in January here in California, but way in the art, way at the end, Newsom admits that his own 12-year-old daughter has not been vaccinated yet. Now, what's the, it's gonna be, oh, Slater, stop attacking the 12-year-old. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want her to be vaccinated either, or whatever, I don't care, it's not her, I'm attacking her, so get out of here with that. Her birthday, uh, oh, so the other excuse is, uh, she just turned 12. Oh, Slater, you're attacking a child, how beneath you, or maybe not. Uh, how typical of you. Also, she just turned 12, Slater. I don't know. Her birthday was September 8th. She's been 12 for like a month and a half. So, I don't know. And then her, the third excuse is um, she needed a series of other shots first. Weird, I've never heard that before. I've never heard that maybe you shouldn't combine this with other shots. Why not do the other shots too? Also weird that the CDC recommends three different vaccines for 11 to 12 year olds. Why didn't she get those vaccines that she needed when she was 11, the ones that the state currently mandates? Why didn't she not get them when she was 11? Why did she wait until she was 12? Here's my guess, and this is purely a guess. Mrs. Newsom is actually an anti-vaxxer. That's my guess, I'm gonna throw it out there. She fits the demographic. You know who's mostly anti-vax? Poor black people and rich white women. Those are the anti-vaxxers, it's true. You look at the, the data, this is going before COVID, but I'm not even talking about COVID, although it's true for COVID too. Before COVID, you look at the data of who's not vaccinated. It's inner city black people and super, super rich white women and their kids. That's Gavin Newsom's wife, by the way. And no one in the media will ask, but I truly wouldn't be surprised if Newsom's, if Newsom's kids aren't vaccinated at all. <laughs> and they'll find some way to get around this for them. They will be exempted. He's the governor. His kids went to school when all the other kids, when all the public school kids weren't allowed to go to school during the height of COVID. They'll find some way that she doesn't have to get the COVID vaccine at all because he's the governor. He can do whatever he wants. All right, I want to take a break because we got great guests today. Let me end with this one last point here. The thing that drives me the most bonkers, this, it, it just makes me feel like I'm taking crazy pills, is when there's something that every single human being, like, I don't even say knew was true. It's like, like so obviously knew was true. And then because of COVID now, we take that thing and it's just memory hold, thrown out the window like it never even happened. And I want to talk about masks. So the American Pediatric Association or American Academy of Pediatrics, however, 
they used to have a section on their website about the importance of face-to-face -face interaction with children and babies and how important it is for a child's development. And then when they came out and said, uh, mask, you should mask your kids, oh, and it doesn't cause any developmental damage, people went back and said, well, your own website. And then they deleted it from their website. Okay, that stuff makes me crazy. Similarly, this is a very famous experiment. It was first done in 1975 about the importance of connection and facial recognition and connection with babies. Uh, and this video does a nice job of explaining this experiment. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction. They react with negative emotions. They turn away. They feel the stress of it. They actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh, yes. Oh, would it be good? Amazing. It's almost kind of like a cruel experiment in ways, right? But now we think it's fine to not only surround our kids with other masked faces, but to muzzle them as well. The heck is wrong with this? But the media can spin everything around, colluding with big tech and the government, and it's getting even harder and harder to find the true story, which is why I'm so glad you're here. We've got Dan Crenshaw coming up in a few minutes. Mike Slater, spread the word. Gender is a fact. This is a fact. Every human being in this room, every human being on Earth, had to pass through the legs of a woman to be on Earth. That is a fact. Comedians are the last line of defense against all the insanity. It's one of the most important professions in existence right now. I remember we did a segment a couple weeks ago, and it was about COVID, and uh, we did a you know, 12 minute segment, a brilliantly articulated and formulated and we wove all these things through, it was just fantastic. And then we ended it with a 30 second comedy bit from Tyler Fisher, uh, pretending to be Fauci. And he just pierced through all of it, pierced right to the point that fast. And in s s it was so much more effective than my erudite 12 minute presentation, my PowerPoint presentation. That's the power of comedy and comedians must be protected and never canceled. Our next guest was a canceled comedian, Josh Denny. Josh, how you doing, brother? I'm good. How are you? Good, brother. I, not only uh, canceled, but erased. Uh, so Food Network, this was just the other day, right? Like a month ago. Uh, yeah. They said, our work, you used to have a show on Food Network. Our working relationship with Josh, as if you didn't know that. I just want to make, did you know <laughs> it used to, used to have? Uh, I, it did our dawn on me, yes. Okay, yeah. Our working relationship with Josh Denny ended years ago. We removed all episodes he hosted at that time. His views do not reflect our company values. We regret giving him a platform. They have to prove their shame to the woke mob. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's pretty wild. And it's wild, especially to me, considering of all the, you know, wild things I've joked about on Twitter over the years that the, they chose the day I came out as a very pro-life supporting the Texas abortion ban, uh, you know, pro-life conservative. That was the time they drew the line in the sand and had to erase me from their history and distance themselves. So I thought it was an interesting uh, spot for them to pick. 
Uh, their viewership had some pretty mixed reactions. I think it was overwhelmingly negative and probably not what they expected. I wonder what their audience is at the Food Network. You know what I mean? Like, and this goes into a different conversation about woke co companies. But, um, like, who, like, who do they think they're appealing to with that? Well, As opposed it? to, I would imagine there's a lot of people in Texas who, you know, are pro-life who watch the Food Network. Well, it's interesting you say that because when they originally hired me to do the show many years ago, they were like, listen, you got to be careful. Our viewership is very conservative. And I was like, well, I don't think that's going to be a problem for me. <laughs> uh, and it wow. turns out it's more of a problem for everybody on the executive side of the company than it actually is for the viewership. Wow, that's interesting. What do you think they intended by that? Or what was their concern when warning their other surely progressive hosts what not to do to a conservative audience? Yeah, I think they presumed because I lived in Los Angeles and worked in entertainment that I was a, you know, a staunch liberal, which I'm not. And, and I really have never been that far on the left in any point in my life. So, you know, it's it's amazing how much is presumed in, in particularly in Hollywood and in show business. And then when you sort of have a differing opinion, it's it it's mind blowing how quickly you become persona non grata. It's almost overnight. Uh, TMZ, as if, you know. Who cares, right? But well, I don't know. Maybe I'm sure they got a lot of hits. Uh, former Food Network star rails on women. Is that what you did? Because we let's let's judge. Let's judge what was cancelable, right? We just got John Gruden was just canceled, so we can right. judge whether or not that email he wrote ten years ago is worthy of being fired. Uh, is what you said? Well, what did you say? Is it worthy of being fired over? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I wasn't fired. I hadn't been with them for a long time. It was sure. more, they were more sort of disowning me after the fact because of this. But what's interesting is, and often a tool of mine as a comedian is, I don't necessarily say the offensive thing. I sort of suggest it. And then it's only offensive if it's something you yourself believe. And so, uh, you know, I used, I used the line, I said only would know they were pregnant after six weeks. And uh, of course, the entire internet was outraged um, because apparently a lot of people out there identify. As and so what's interesting <laughs> to me is that, again, for yeah. you to be offended by that joke, that's how, how you have to feel about yourself. And, um, you know, so that was kind of the reaction. I, I think Food Network picked this one just for simple facts. The entire executive team over there are women. Uh, everybody that pulls the strings and kind of heads the different departments at, at Food Network and Discovery and Scripps are all women. So I think this one just sort of struck a chord because I was coming out in support of life over the, you know, the the fake stance of choice. I mean, there are plenty of choices that don't result in ending a life. And so, um, you know, as always, the argument gets conflated about trying to control women's bodies. And that's when I became a target of the Food Network. What's Scripps? You know, uh, you have Food Network owned by Discovery. What's yeah, Scripps? Scripps was the parent company that owns uh, Food Network, Travel Channel, and everything else, and then they were acquired by Discovery in 2017. Okay. okay. So, yeah, I love that so you just Scripps keep going Networks, back and back. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's amazing because there's all these different sort of secondary and tertiary companies that all have CEOs, and they're all women. And so there's a CEO of Discovery and then a CEO of Scripps and then a president of Food Network. And so, you know, there's a lot of these titles for people that essentially get in a room and, and decide things in a hive mind. Yep. Uh, can you speak to what I said in the beginning about the importance and the power of comedy in uh, all times, but especially in an era like this? Well, the Dave Chappelle clip is such a great example, right? I think what Dave is trying to do in this circumstance is, is open the dialogue between the black community and the LGBTQ community and say, this is why we can't get on the same page, because you view your struggle as somehow more important than ours, and we view our struggle as more important than yours. And so wh where a lot of people, I feel like, miss the point is, rather than applaud Dave for trying to start that conversation, it's like they say in Moneyball, first one through the wall always gets bloody, um, you know, he's they try to tear him down for it. And, that's, and, and my retort was, you know, the response should be a trans uh, comedian having the guts to come out and actually talk about uh, the separation between the black community and the LGBTQ community from their perspective and what the black community's problems are in that exchange. But nobody has the guts on the other side to do that. And this is a prime example of what we always have predicted, that the woke will eventually eat itself. So now you have a, a man of color talking about uh, why that struggle isn't as important to him and sharing his free speech, you know, First Amendment 
perspective and doing it in a funny sort of typical Dave way. And there is nobody on the other side of this discussion that's even capable of answering from a talent perspective, from a comedy perspective, and from an intelligent perspective. So they cry and they moan and they protest and they stage walkouts. Yep. And the most important thing of all that is it has to be funny. If it's not funny, it's not going to hit. It's got to be funny. Right. And it's hard to do that. Uh, Josh, what is your Locals website? And are you making more money on Locals than you were at the Food Network? No, that would be nice. Let's get to that level. Let's get to the level where I'm making more money on locals. Uh, you go to joshdenny.locals.com. My, my podcast is available there as well as a bonus show every week. And then I also do a show for censored.tv called Next Week Tonight, which is a, a new show that makes fun of uh, new shows. <laughs> Beautiful. joshdenny.locals.com. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate you, man. Hey, great having you. We're a great day. Keep it up. Coming up next, uh, Congressman Dan Crenshaw. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, my oldest son just turned five yesterday, and we ordered for him, of course, the new book by Dan Crenshaw, Fame, Blame, and the Raft of Shame. It's a kid's book. Congressman, how are you, sir? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for ordering Great the book. To talk to you. Yeah, man. Give me, the, uh, give me the genesis of this. Give me the story. Well, it's, it's a cool project. Uh, I was approached by Brave Books, and um, they, this is part of a saga, so it's a different author every month. Uh, the book I wrote is on cancel culture. Uh, and obviously, you can see some of my story sort of infused throughout that book and uh, comes with a set of lesson plans at the end of it where parents can go into a little bit more detail, a little bit more understanding about what cancel culture is, what it isn't, uh, some advice for me on how to talk about this, because I, I do think conservatives get it wrong sometimes. And it's also about forgiveness, right? I mean, no, it's uh, not just standing up to cancel culture, but but forgiving someone instead of trying to cancel them uh, if the situation is appropriate. So it, it, it's just a cool way for, for conservative parents to have another tool in their toolkit to teach their kids. Because it's hard, you don't, I think the Tuttle Twins are the only other conservative children's books that I've ever heard of. Uh, now, when you subscribe and you go to dan.bravebooks.com to subscribe, you get a new book every month. Uh, I, I think it's a cool project. Glad to be a part of it. Very good. Give me the fame aspect of it. Well, <laughs> so, so the book is about this, uh, this, this fictional place called Freedom Island. And within Freedom Island, there's Starlet City, which is like an underwater city. So it's just, it's just fun. It's creative. Uh, and in Starlet City is sort of their version of Broadway. Okay, it's where all the comedians go, all the shows go. So that's where the fame part comes into it. Uh, and, and somebody in the audience gets canceled to get thrown onto this raft of shame by this mean comedian. And then the heroine, uh, Eva the hippopotamus, uh, eventually uh, stands up to the cancel culture and says, no, like he didn't mean this insult that he directed at, as it turns out, a, a mountain lion with an eye patch who, who lost it battling a shark <laughs> before. So you, you can see where it's all going. And, and look, it gets, it gets to a deeper point here. Well, what is cancel culture and what it isn't? And cancel culture is is generally um, making traditional values taboo. Okay, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is a, a severe overreaction to what is an unintentional joke or something. And, and that's so that's my story of cancel culture. You know, with SNL, uh, and then that's this story as well. So you, you you can divide it up in a few different categories. But it, it's important that we recognize it, define it, and then learn how to battle it. What's your uh, counter to the devil's advocate of, um, well, it's not cancel culture, Congressman. This is keeping people accountable. It's important to have accountability in our country. What do you say? Yeah. You know, I, I don't like that word a whole lot. Both sides use it. And it, it's usually just a, it's, it's a nicer word for just a, a disingenuous criticism oftentimes. I think everybody be, should, should be held accountable. But you have to do something wrong. To be held accountable, you know, and and so like, let's look at an old tweet that somebody tweeted once, and the first question you have to ask yourself is, did they mean it? Are they sorry for it? Intent matters quite a bit, and, and the problem with cancel culture oftentimes is that it removes intent from the equation. Like, was this person motivated by some kind of hatred for someone? 
Or did they just make a stupid joke? Like, did they screw up? Are they human beings? You know, and that's a, that's a proper question. Oh, if you intended to hurt someone, right? If you intended to do something provocative and mean that, uh, that frankly goes against hundreds of years of, of normal traditional values anyway, you should be held accountable for that. You know, we have laws to hold people accountable for that. And like there's, it is a free democracy or a free speech where, where you know, uh, public shaming is, is indeed okay. Um, but you can public, but we should be able to stand up to public shaming too, right? It should go both ways. And that, that is the essence of debate. I don't know if that's too complicated an answer for, for that me. question, but it's a complicated subject. Well, do you ascribe people doing this, people doing the canceling? Do you think it's part of a larger like goal or is it just miserable people tearing, like hurt people hurt people, just miserable people tearing people down because they're, they're not fulfilled in their own lives and all the rest? Well, I think that's certainly a part of it, um, you know, because I, I have trouble understanding someone who's, who's so passionate about this this thing, right? It, uh, I'm like, do you have nothing else going on in your life? You know, so that's yeah. it's a valid question. Um, but it, it's also a tactic uh, on a more strategic level, especially for the left. And, and it happens on the right, too. If we think we don't have cancel culture within our own ranks, we're crazy because it absolutely happens. Um but it, but it's very prevalent on the left, and and I think more prevalent simply because the left has institutions like Hollywood, uh, the the major media companies. So so you just see it more. And um, well, here's what it is: it's it's a cheap way to bypass debate. So it's a tactic, right? Because you don't have to debate someone if they're a Nazi, right? Well, everything they say must be evil. So if you try to cancel them in that sense and discredit them, because that's what cancel culture is, it's a form of discreditation. And then you don't have to listen to anything they say. You don't have to actually make an argument. You don't have to do the hard work of that free speech battle and make an argument for your case. So it's 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 cheap tactics is what it is. Yeah, I like that. Uh, on tomorrow's show, we're gonna talk with Gad Sad, and it's a part of our special. Uh, he's we talked to a mom, yeah, he's awesome. We talked to a mom uh, who was sued by the school board in Rhode Island. I'm sure you know her, Nicole Solis. And then uh, we talked to a firefighter in LA. Half of the firefighters in LA right now are unvaccinated and they're gonna be fired next week. Uh, no one's talking about that story. Um, and then get sad and we're gonna talk about cowardice and courage, right? And how to, inst how to get that honey badger instinct. Um, you have it, right? You have as what Gad said is the honey badger instinct. Are you discouraged by this, the lack of it, <laughs> perhaps in others or the, the state of our country? And we could tie it into cancel if you want, but just big picture. Are you discouraged yeah. by people not stepping up more? I'm discouraged by quite a few things. Um, <laughs> look, I'll, I'll, I'll wait in philosophical. I don't know if this is philosophical. I think it gets at the heart of your question, which is um, how do you how do you maintain a country based on this the conceived in liberty, as, as Abraham Lincoln said? How do you maintain that? Um, and what is freedom? And why is it important? And I, I think it's fundamentally true that the only kind of person that can operate in a free environment. Uh, is, is somebody with some kind of mental fortitude, somebody who, who, who embraces this notion of personal responsibility, who says, it is my destiny, I'm in control of it. Uh, yeah, there's gonna be problems, there's gonna be people who don't like me, but I can do this, right? I can compete. Um, if you're not like that, then by definition, you're expecting somebody else to be helping you through it. And you're more likely to vote for socialist policies, right? Because that's a politician saying, look, I'm going to make them do this for you because you're the victim. And so mental fortitude is it's, it's the most important thing for a free society. And it's also the thing that I, I agree with Gad said, it, I, I worry about most that people don't have it. And, um, and, and you can relate that to a number of things. You can relate it to, to standing up to, to tyranny and to, to certain the certain policies, that's a case-by-case -case thing. I, I, I look at it much more broadly in the sense of, are we going to preserve freedoms or not? Um, or are we going to ask politicians to make us safer, to do things for us, mm -hmm. to give us money? Uh, th that has much deeper long-term consequences. 45 seconds. We talk a lot about the difference between 1984 and Brave New World. Uh, so are you more concerned that we're going to have a 1984 approach where freedom of speech is taken away? Or more of a brave new world approach where people don't even use their freedom of speech to the For same a brave country. new world. For a brave new world because you know brave new world you're basically bought off, you're drugged up, and you're you're fat and you're happy. Uh, here's your here's your here's your check from the government every month. Uh, I, I'm I'm afraid of a brave new world. 
go uh, get the book, Fame, Blame, and the Raft of Shame. And if long term, we want to end this. Uh, you got to get to our kids before before they do. Uh, Congressman, appreciate uh, everything you're doing, and glad you're uh, you're getting healthy again, sir. I appreciate it. Again, it's dan.bravebooks.com. Thanks. Beautiful. Thank you, brother. dan.bravebooks.com. Fame, blame, and the raft of shame. I mentioned it. Our uh, special tomorrow. A mom who's been sued by the school board for asking too many questions. And then half of L.A. firefighters, firefighters are going to be fired next week because they're not fully vaccinated. And then uh, get sad to wrap it all up. How to get that honey badger instinct back in you and all of us. It's tomorrow's special. True story. Mike Slater. Spread the word.